Welcome, I'm Dennis McQuistion, and water is the most valuable resource on earth. So the most important question is, do America in general and Texas in specific have enough adequate water now and for the future? Now, typically we would ask the experts to answer that question, but I'm gonna preempt them and I'm gonna tell you that the answer is no. And that's why you and your family and your friends need to watch this video because we're gonna talk about what causes that problem, the solutions to it, and just as importantly, what you personally can do about it. And to introduce the guests and get us started is my co-host, Lisa Hembry. Lisa is a former Dallas County treasurer. She's got a background in media and literacy. And more relative to this particular program, she is a board member of the Trinity River Authority. So Lisa, why don't you introduce our guests and get us started in this great discussion? Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Jim Bradbury. He is an attorney specializing in water issues, eminent domain issues, and environmental issues. He, his firm has offices in Austin, Texas, and Fort Worth. And he's also an adjunct professor at Texas A&M. And then Howard Slobodin serves as general counsel of the Trinity River Authority of Texas. He's been involved in public policy around water issues for the past 20 years. And he's also an adjunct professor at Texas A&M. Good morning, gentlemen, how are you? And Howard, let's get started with um, talking a little bit about the TRA, what it does, and then we'll get into some issues about water usage. Well, thank you, Lisa. TRA is a special district that was created by the Texas legislature in 1955, primarily charged with the development and conservation of water within the Trinity River Basin. Uh, we have a 17 county political jurisdiction that extends from Tarrant County all the way to Chambers County on Trinity Bay, which is part of the Galveston Bay complex. We're actively involved in wholesale wastewater treatment, we are the local sponsor of three reservoirs operated by the United States Army Corps of Engineers. And we also own and operate Lake Livingston, which is the largest piece of municipal supply belonging to the city of Houston. So let's talk about drought. We do have um, a graphic about the drought situation in the United States. And wh what uh, causes a drought? And why do we have a drought? And where is the most severe drought? Well, there are certainly some theories about what causes recurring droughts in the Western United States. Uh, climate science is still in development. A lot of people have suggested that uh, the El Nino-La Nina cycle, which is a result of mid-Pacific or equatorial Pacific Ocean temperatures, uh, can drive drought both in the Western United States, more specifically in Texas. But there are also some other effects that may occur over a longer time period. Of course, there's a possibility of anthropogenic climate change, um, but I, I think we would not be being honest with ourselves if we didn't recognize that the West and Texas have struggled with drought many, many times uh, over the course of recorded history. So drought is not an exception in Texas and really for the Western United States as well. We don't typically enjoy average rain years. We bounce back and forth on a cycle from abundance or, or overabundance uh, to drought pretty routinely. You have a graph about the 1927 uh, meteorologist who talked about the fact that we have a, an extended drought with periods of occasional flooding. Um, I know that TRA deals with this always. We certainly do. And, you know, I think what's really interesting about this quote is number one, the date associated with it, you know, early 1920s or relatively early 20th century. And the fact that we've seen it play out time and time again in hydrology, both in the West and in Texas. If we think about the drought of 2011 to 2015, uh, it was followed by two extremely wet springs, 2015 and 2016. And so we don't generally ease out of a drought gently. Droughts are frequently broken in Texas by significant rain, which can involve significant flooding as well. And flooding creates another issue because it's about storage, right? And what happens to that excess water? Are we able to use it? 
you know, sadly, not as much as I think we would like to be able to. Um, you know, when we have flooding, water generally carries a pretty high sediment loading, and we've built a lot of storage in Texas uh, to conserve water. Um, the federal government has built some storage to mitigate flooding, but we really don't have the storage to conserve the type of rainfall that we saw in 2015 and 2016. There's probably engineering reasons and financial reasons why that's not the case. Um, you know, we you would have to have a significant amount of dry storage on a year in year out basis to really capture that volume of flood water. And I will say this, that if we look back historically in Texas, what has driven policymaking in Texas with respect to water has been both droughts and floods. And so coming out of a, a drought in the middle 1990s, we saw regional water planning undergo major le legislative changes in 1997. And then also following Hurricane Harvey, we saw tremendous legislative activity to address these flooding issues. Yeah, we're, we're gonna come back to Texas in just a minute, but I wanna take you west. You mentioned California. We have a brief video while you're talking about Lake Mead and, and Nevada, California, and those places we think of wildfires and all that. Uh, hit on that for just a minute before we come back to Texas. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. And you know, what we see out west uh, is, again, we do not see average rainfall years. We see a cycle that goes from abundance or overabundance to fairly punishing drought. And of course, uh, this has significant effects on domestic water supply in the West. A tremendous amount of money has been invested and continues to be invested uh, to move water around California, moving water uh, among Oregon and California. But then again, there's also unique ecological challenges that they face out there. Um, there are There's a tension in both the Pacific Northwest and the um, in California with regard to endangered species. And so you have the competing needs for municipal supply with the need to maintain an adequate amount of water mm -hmm. in rivers and streams to support sound ecology. Well, the endangered species will be all of us if we don't solve this problem, unfortunately. Now let me bring you uh, back to Texas and we have graphic number 17, which is one of the things that you, you made a speech in recently and you used this slide, which I found particularly interesting because you talked about the drought of 1956 and of course the drought of 1995. You can see that on there and you mentioned when uh, the TRA was formed and all that. And the reason I wanted to mention that is because I'm the only one on this program, Howard, you and Jim and Lisa, old enough to remember personally the drought of 1956. And I would tell you, that my parents had me mowing the yard. And I would also tell you that I lost three lawnmowers because of the cracks in the yard. And so when people think about drought, I mean, they, most people have never really seen what I call a real drought. But, but in Texas today, obviously we have uh, uh, different parts of the state have worse than other places. We've been lucky the last few years, I think. And we have water issues um, that, that Jim, I wanna bring you in on to uh, to explain to that viewer the difference between the types of water, and we've got one of your speech things, um, graphics that you made, it's number three, and it talks about the difference between sort of surface and groundwater and those kind of things. So while we put that up, why don't you differentiate that so that that viewer can understand the types of water we deal with? When we're looking at sources of water, where that's going to come from, we've got two two big ones that uh, water law and water policy planners are looking at surface water, uh, which may, maybe is about as easy as it sounds. It's if you're driving down the road, it's pretty much everything you can see, our lakes, our rivers, our streams, uh, our ponds, that's our surface water. And then of course, groundwater is uh, all, the, all, all of our well water, windmill water, that's coming from irrigation out in, uh, in the high plains. Uh, that, that, that feeds a lot of our farming. And those are regulated very differently uh, here in Texas as well as other states. It's kind of a state by state approach. And so those are the two broad categories of water. Um, without going into a lot of detail, I'll tell you that, that when you see significant drought like Howard was uh, explaining there, what, what you see behind the scenes is we go to our groundwater. 
when we're not getting the rainfall, we have a lot of evaporation like you see in Lake Mead, then, then what you do is you begin producing very, very rapidly that, that groundwater reserve. And many of those reserves do not replenish, some recharge. So there's a, there's a connection between those two sources of, of water, Dennis, that's really important. Well, there is, and it's um, a political thing often as well, because the legislature gets involved in each state. And then, of course, there are federal uh, regulators as well. But we're all trying to figure out how to have the right amount of good, usable water in the right place at the right price. And it's not an easy thing to do. One of the things that I talked about in the open was not just, you know, whether we have enough water today, but whether they're going to have it for the future. So. I'd like to put up a graphic that both of you have uh, are very knowledgeable about, and that's graphic number 18. It has to do with population growth. So Jim, why don't you uh, sort of tell that viewer what Texas in particular is looking at for the future? One of the primary drivers in why this uh, water um, equation is, is very concerning to me and, and water policy planners is not only just the climate issues that Howard talked about, but all of the new residents that are coming to Texas, you know, that, that is demand. Um, and we talk about it as the Texas miracle, how many U-Hauls are coming in here from California and, and the, North, uh, the, the Northeast. But if you begin to think about that rapid population rise, it's not just the water in the taps. When you have new residents coming in, you're gonna have new schools, you're gonna have new roads, you're gonna have uh, new power plants and power plants are going to require more and more water. So it's a very multi-factor dynamic that's all pointing at an, am an amazing amount of water that we're going to have to generate to meet that population demand. And unlike other commodities, Dennis, uh, we're not really making any new water. So what we've got to do is plan for that water to how to effectively utilize the water that we have now. We can't run out and manufacture it. Uh, short of desalination of, of, of seawater. So it's a very concerning dynamic from, from a policy standpoint of how are we going to meet that target of those new residents. And lastly, I'd say this is not something that's unique to Texas. We have the growth of very, very large city centers all across the United States as people gravitate towards those cities and they need that water. And oftentimes that water is not where those cities are. So we've got to figure out how to find it and import it back to those major urban centers. Thank you so much, Jim. We do have two graphics, um, slides number 10 and 13, I believe that talk about supply and demand. Howard, we are looking at your presentation that you presented to the Dallas Bar Association recently. Let's talk about where the supply, what the supply and demand relate to one another. How are we going to get enough water and who's using it? Well, if we look at what's going to happen over time in Texas, uh, with population growth, th that chart lays out a population growth of approximately 22, per, uh, sorry, 22 million people over the period from 2020 to 2070. And so, I think it's very important to realize that our existing supplies are also not static. So our existing supplies will be reduced as time passes. And there's two primary reasons why that's the case. Number one, reservoirs collect silt. So the conservation storage volume of a reservoir decreases over time. And then to go back uh, to what Jim had mentioned, um, Texas relies uh, to a a certain extent on groundwater that does not recharge. It is depleted and it will not recharge in a meaningful way in several lifetimes or perhaps even longer than that. And so for folks in Northwest Texas who depend on the Ogallala Aquifer, um, their supplies are going to decrease substantially over time and it's gonna change the way that water is used. A lot of water is used in the Ogallala for uh, agricultural irrigation. At some point, that's going to become not economically feasible. And what we see in this figure four or five is we, is we see, in fact, that use for irrigation is going to decline uh, pretty significantly. That decline is, is primarily associated with the depletion of groundwater and then also limited groundwater availability in the Rio Grande Valley, which is another large agricultural area in the state of Texas. And at the same time, we see municipal demand increasing. 
although it doesn't increase by the same percentage as population. And so that says something good to me in terms about conservation. Um, conservation has done a lot in terms of allowing us to stretch the supplies we already have, but we're going to have to continue to do more in the future to be able to meet the needs of a population that is in excess of 50 million people. It's been exciting uh, for me personally as a board member of the Trinity River Authority to know that water planning in the state of Texas uh, is a 50 year outlook and you've been very involved in that, Howard. Are we ready? Well, you know, the, a great plan is, is a great plan as long as it stays on the shelf, right? You can have the best plan in the world unless you put it into action, you're still gonna be in the same situation. And so I will say that I believe water planning has been a success in the sense that we have now seen projects planned for and projects constructed. So we are implementing the state water plan. I fear that that will become more difficult as time goes on um, for political reasons and for financial reasons. As Jim alluded to, moving water from areas where water is abundant to where water is needed, um, it creates uh, political strife. And that's something that we're gonna have to come to terms with, especially in Texas, um, as if we're going to achieve the goal of having sufficient water for, for all sectors. I'm curious about uh, Jim Bradbury, about eminent domain. Is the state um, in a position to take land for water? Can we depend on our poli the political will of our leaders to make sure that we have access to that groundwater and surface water? Yeah, you can. Let me uh, explain what the laws are out there, but you can see eminent domain in the area of water in a couple of ways. And as everyone watching this program knows, eminent domain is a very uh, political and divisive topic because you've got a government entity uh, taking private property uh, for, for public good. One example, which is not well known, but there's a statute on the books here in Texas uh, where a, a, a city water provider can actually condemn uh, groundwater interests. So they could go out where there is groundwater and can condemn those, acquire title to that and produce that groundwater. You know, to my knowledge, that statute has never been acted upon. It's gotten pretty close in matters that I've been involved, but it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's very divisive. I mean, we hope that that's going to be an arm's length negotiation and the purchase of those rights, but it could happen. The second area where you could see eminent domain, and, and we do see this, is the construction of reservoirs. Uh, we've got a couple of reservoirs out uh, under construction up in Northeast Texas. Um, there's consideration of a new reservoir up around Wichita Falls, um, possibly the Marvin Nichols Reservoir, probably one of the longest, uh, most fractured debates that have taken place in Texas for, for wh whether that reservoir is gonna be built. But once it's permitted, they will negotiate for and potentially condemn that land from private landowners in order to build that reservoir. So you, you could see it. Lastly, uh, pipelines to move water. Howard's authority, as well as the others that move water from East Texas back to the Metroplex or to Houston, you've got to build those big pipelines um, and, and you'll have to use eminent domain to do it. Well, uh, you've given us great causes of the situation. You've given us a situation. Now let's look at solutions. and. As Lisa mentioned, this plan that you've come up with is a great one. We have graphic number 35, and there are several different ways to solve this problem. And Howard, why don't you take, let's just say, the first couple there uh, and, and explain to that viewer what those are, and then we'll talk about the other issues in just a minute with Jim. Certainly, Dennis. Well, what this figure reflects is it reflects by percentage uh, the share of recommended water management strategies in the 2022 uh, Texas State Water Plan. And so we see that surface water um, is the largest group of strategies that's going to be reservoir construction to a large extent. And so, you know, as Jim mentioned, that's an expensive and politically, it can be a politically fraught um, path to, to head down, but we very well may have to do it. The second uh, most abundant group of strategies is actually demand management, and that's conservation. Um, conservation, again, has been very successful, but we may reach a point 
uh, with conservation of diminishing returns. And so I think we need to think about how we're using water, you know, for things like uh, turf grass irrigation in Texas. When we look at our peak demands, our peak demand for water is, of course, in the hottest part of the summer. And that's not because people are taking more baths and showers. It's because people are watering outdoors. And so um, we need to be looking at those practices, thinking about how we can conserve water for outdoor irrigation so that we don't have to go out and condemn land for new reservoirs. And then um, the third most uh, abundant strategy in the plan, of course, is reuse. And that's something that's really been taking place uh, since the beginning of modern wastewater treatment. We're relying more on treated wastewater effluent as a source of supply uh, in the future. Uh, that is not what we would refer to as toilet to tap. That's water that's being discharged by a wastewater treatment plant and diverted downstream. Now, and then Howard, treated Howard let me stop you there for a second. I know you're saying it's not toilet to tap. I know you're saying that. <laughs> When we did a program on this a few years ago, we actually had a video showing I went down the toilet and got redone out in the particular areas where you clean the water and it comes back to the tap. So I want you to, first of all, reassure that viewer that it's not that. And yet a lot of that water that we use does get reused. And then same time you said demand management and you, you talked about conservation. What can that viewer personally do to help on both parts of this. Yeah, certainly. So toilet to tap is not something that has really been implemented in any large scale in Texas. That would be where water is leaving a wastewater treatment plant, going directly to a water treatment plant to be treated and used. In reality, a lot of the flow in Texas rivers is actually treated wastewater effluent that's being diverted downstream and treated to drinking water standards. So this is not something new. This is something that's been going on in Texas probably for the last 75 years in a, in, a, in a pretty large scale way. And then in terms of outdoor water conservation, I think we need to be thinking about native plants. We need to be thinking about um, landscape that is drought tolerant, landscape that requires less water even in an average year. Um, I know that we all like a large, nice green lawn, but those things take real water and that real water has real costs both in terms of what you're gonna pay for it, and then also in terms of land that may be taken, as Jim mentioned, for the construction of new reservoir. And that's one of the things that we frequently hear in terms of inter-regional strife is, you know, this part of Texas wants to build a reservoir in this other part of Texas so that they can all water their lawns in the summer. And, and you know, that's not, a, that's not a helpful conversation. I think if everybody was doing their best in terms of outdoor water conservation, um, these kind of projects would go more smoothly. Okay, Jim, uh, anything you'd like to add? Some of those other uh, solutions to the problem? Yeah, a couple of things, but before I do, I just want to underscore, you know, we're talking about scarcity here, planning, uh, a, a pretty concerning situation, but I want to, to give credit to our ingenuity and technology uh, in, in Texas and elsewhere. We're coming, we're, we're doing things differently, which I'm encouraged by. One, you know, groundwater is an alternative source, as I, I mentioned earlier, where it comes from underneath. But we're seeing some large scale pro projects. Uh, notable is is down around uh, a water supply project for San Antonio, where the water is being pumped from an aquifer up around east of Austin in, in Bastrop area. And that's a three billion dollar project. Water's being pipelined. If you know how far it is from Bastrop to San Antonio, that's an enormous project to move plentiful groundwater down to an urban area that doesn't have it. So groundwater is one. Um, another very interesting development is desalination. You know, we, we've, we've heard about that from seawater desalination and there are projects in place to do that. It's very energy intensive. So there's a tough balance to draw there because it takes a lot of power to generate that um, desal. But within the desal realm, probably the most promising is desalination of what we call brackish water. And brackish water is merely groundwater that has a higher salinity content than regular groundwater. And the estimates the Water Development Board have of, of brackish water in Texas is almost unlimited. So there's a very, very large, and it's much easier to desal than seawater because the salt content is not as high, so you don't use as much power. And then lastly, one of my favorites is aquifer storage and recovery. 
you asked Howard early on, well, what about if we have a, a very heavy rain and all that water is there, how can we grab that? And this is a method where we can grab water when it's plentiful and around us, clean it, then we store it down in the aquifer. We actually push that water down there and hold it until we need it, um, which is a wonderful way to do it because the, the, the key difference there is you don't have any evaporation loss. Our reservoirs in Texas, when we hit 100, 105 degrees in August, you know, if you could see the water we're losing off the top of those into the air, it would really scare you. And so this is a technology to avoid that, uh, avoid that evaporative loss. So I think it's really an encouraging story. Well, you know, like I said before, we put a tremendous amount of effort into both regional water planning and state water planning in Texas. Um, but putting those plans into action is really what's going to be critical to meet our future needs. So, you know, I think we're entering a time where we're really going to have to double down. And I think we need to elevate the level of both public consciousness and public conversation about water. Um, I think a lot of people take for granted uh, as long as it comes out of the tap. Uh, when they go to brush their teeth or take a shower, they're satisfied. But I think um, as a state and a nation, really, we need to be thinking and talking about water much more than we are. Well, Howard, you have just given me the perfect close because we have been just been doing that for the last 30 minutes. We give these um, viewer every week unique perspectives on things that matter with people who care. So join us on social media, join in next week when we talk about worldwide water situations, because as always, uh, we give you the perspectives that you want to hear. Jim, you and Howard were great. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. See you next week.